Hello everyone. Welcome to NPTEL course on Rural Water Resource Management. This is week eight, lecture three. In this week, we have been looking at the issues in rural water resource management, especially from the schemes that are existing and the lo local agenda of participation with farmers and also <coughs> stakeholders, etc. We also looked at the UN definition of water security and what are the four themes where water security is assessed. We understood that it is not a single ownership or stakeholders perspective. There should be a combined holistic approach for water management. If um, one or two of these fail, if you do not acknowledge these partners in assessing and monitoring these rural water resources, then there is potential of the system to collapse. Let's move on for, further to look at what are the issues that we have noticed in rural water resource management. In today's lecture, we will discuss about ownership. What is ownership? Let's define this word. When someone gives you a gift, or uh, for example, for your birthday, a gift is given, who's the owner of the gift? Is the owner the person who bought the gift or is it you because you have in possession the gift? And that is the question which is um, being raised here when you talk about the assets. Remember last uh, class, we showed a map of where the water resources are placed by the government, especially the Mandrega project. Under the Mandrega, there is NRM and in our NRM, there is some water resource projects. So in the water resource projects, the government has put the Mandrika money. However, there is no ownership of these structures. In the previous years, before the Mandrika was um, uh, given in, in as assets, it was given as money. Started with 100 rupees and then now it has increased based on the inflation. So when the government gives a farmer money, then the money goes into them and they are the owner, right? But if the cost and then the pay which they give them and the money which is given is based on the work which is done like making a tank for uh, rural irrigation or storing water, why is that not taken as ownership? So this is the question where the government also wants to know. We have given you a platform, we have given you the money and construction materials, etc. Now we have constructed it but if you do not take care of it, who is the loser? There is no rules and suggestions saying that if we build this, you have to take it ownership. Since the rules are not there, people are still not sure who is the owner and or there is laziness and um, uh, they don't want to um, see others getting the benefit because uh, only some part of the society will be working on the water where others will be enjoying. Right? So they want to be very sure that either all should participate as a rule or mandate or no one participates. Unfortunately, the later is what is happening. No one is participating in most of these programs. Let's take some examples. So these wells, you could see, should be managed <laughs> properly, excuse me, properly along the edges. If these roots and other obstructions happen, then slowly the structures will break and then collapse into the well. So here's a well where the labor for digging the well, hand digging and placing all these structures, there is a labor cost, was given as an NRM project to the farmers. They were paid for it. But then if you don't manage it, then whose problem is it? Same thing on this uh, check dam also. They've given you the money for the machinery, the ingredients, the, the concrete, the rocks and cement. They've also given you your location and a labor to construct it, the labor cost per day cost. But after it is running for some years, if it breaks down, no one is taking care of it. And the Mandrega money now moves to the next asset. So after one asset, it goes to the next asset, next asset. They want to build many assets for water resource management. 
But this one is a loss now. All the money that has been put, all the time that has been put is a loss. Another thing is it is built on government land. For example, this one is built on the river, across the river. And that river is owned by no one, by the government. A farmer might have the land on this side, okay? So this part of the land may be owned by farmer A, and this part of the land might be owned by farmer B. But in between the, the river and the buffers along the river or the stream, is owned by the government. You cannot uh, encroach it. So this is another reason like they don't want to get in because it is not on their land. Okay. So who owns these structures and maintains them is the most important question. And that is what ownership means. On paper, on record, it is Mandrega assets. It is assets which are paid by the Mandrega and it is the government assets. And normally, <clears throat> government assets are taken care by government, right? For example, <clears throat> you have street lights, you have roads. Um, if it breaks, then you call the corporation office, uh, the city office, and then they'll fix it. If the bulbs are not uh, coming up in the street, you call them, they fix it or they maintain it often. Okay. Even the divider in cities where it has flowers and plants is maintained by the government. But here, once it is built, once it's given to the farmers, not as a property, but as an asset, it has to be maintained by either. Uh, and because the government, Mandrika has to move on to the next projects, there is no capacity built and it is not viable to build that capacity to maintain these. So it has to be the government or the local NGOs who help in making these <coughs> structures. So government NGOs uh, or government agencies construct them, but then what happens? They put so much time and effort and NGOs are very, very important like Dan Foundation. Here it is uh, Marvi, it was ACT, um, uh, all these foundations and uh, NGOs who work on the ground for the people are getting affected because they see this in front of their eyes getting wasted, okay? Which should have been taken care of. So the long-term sustainability is not achieve. It's not that the farmers don't know the benefit of it. That is the other point. When the water was flowing, they could see that, okay, the water is ponding. I can lift it for my irrigation. When there's water in the well, they could see they could access the water for domestic use. Then why not manage it? Why not maintain it is the question. <clears throat> there are other uh, um, um, ownership also okay so one side it is the maintenance and management by the locals who are actually using them and there is lack of ownership by agencies on the medium to higher um, structures the user structure might have changed example from irrigation to domestic use so in which circumstances that the ownership itself becomes a question mark is the question okay let's take a classic example of bangalore in Bangalore, uh, initially there was a lot of agriculture happening inside the city, along the periphery, etc. But slowly, when urbanization happened, what happens to the rural lakes? So there were lakes inside the city, which was giving water to the agricultural field. So it was managed by the agriculture department. But once that land has been sold and urbanization happens, then there is no mandate for the agricultural agency to maintain the lake. Then what happens? The urban agency should take it up. But suddenly a lake cannot be built and given to the ownership of the, of the uh, urban agency, right? So that is where now the lake stands without an ownership. And that is what we are trying to tell here. The use of the structure might have changed from irrigation to domestic use. When it becomes domestic, it is Jaljeevan mission. When it becomes to irrigation, it is agriculture department. You see how there are two different sectors just for water. Okay, you built a dam, a small check dam, or and the check dam is holding the water and then siphoning it into the tanks and uh, filtration for drinking, for example. Once it was irrigation, and once the irrigation land has all taken up and groundwater has been used, then this is more used for domestic use. So now the irrigation department won't uh, manage it because it is not their mandate. Just because it was once uh, uh, irrigation structure, it is not their mandate, which is compulsion to maintain it. It is the domestic uh, sector, which is the Jal Jeevan mission, for example. Less budget for operations and maintenance. This is where the agency have to give it out or just let it go and then go to the next. 
less budget for operations and maintenance. If you look at these structures, there is a budget for uh, labor. There's a budget for uh, um, the uh, materials like uh, sand, silt, clay, um, cement, rocks, etc. There's a budget for the engineers, but there's no budget for maintenance because these projects have to close in two years, three years. For example, they'll say, build a check dam within one year. This is the budget. But where's the budget to maintain it? Suppose it breaks after two years. Which budget should you put to uh, repair it? Otherwise, the whole structure is gone. Okay, like we saw in the previous slide, if one part of the check dam is broken, the entire uh, work objective of the check dam is gone. And slowly, the other parts also start to break. So less budget for operations and maintenance or not thinking about that budget is an issue for water management. Project term and new projects. As I said, uh, the, the agency is there for building check dams and they are not constantly looking for old projects and renewing it. They're making new, new um, uh, projects because every year you get tax money and the tax money goes to Mandrega and the Mandrega goes to NRM. So it's like us, it's like, uh, a cascading effect. Um, so they have less manpower. For example, a thousand uh, engineers are there. Their goal is to go and build these uh, water infrastructures. And there's no capacity or team built for management and maintenance. So it is on the stakeholders. It is on us like academics and, and uh, faculties, research centers to look at these and give it to the public and the agency, government agency to repair and manage it. So the need of the hour, which means the urgent, urgent need is role of NGOs. What is an NGO for those who don't um, know much about it? It is a non-governmental organization. It is a non-profit organization, okay? Which means they have a setup like a company, a consultancy company, but they do not take profit. There's no profit which they have to record and then sustain the system. It is just uh, for example, it will be an office and with a lot of uh, staff and volunteers, they will collect money from the government and then they will do it for the public. No profit built. It is only the salaries which are as per the government rules uh, and regulations, the salaries are kept, only that salaries they'll take. So it is like a company which does not work for a profit. There's no profit here. Okay, so that is a non-profit uh, agency and non-governmental is because it is not associated with a government sector. However, it works for the government projects. So for example, I make medicine as, an, as a company, I'm making medicine um, and um, um, for, I sell it to the government. I sell it to the government and the government buys the medicine and distributes it to the public. How the medicine helps uh, the, the local, how the medicine has to be administered uh, the doctor cannot go everywhere and do it. It is the role of NGOs. Okay. So that is how NGOs are in the sector. And they're very, very important because these are run by people who do not care about profits. Most of them, I'm saying, they, most of the NGOs. Um, and it has a goal of uh, rural development or development of the public, development of the ecosystem. For example, there's an NGO for forest. There's an NGO for public. There is an NGO for animals, birds, dogs. Etc. So many NGOs work with people on the ground and train them to build capacity. So the role of NGOs has been very important in this capacity building. The government officer who is making the assets, the uh, infrastructure, check dams, etc., need not teach the public about the check dams. Their role is they get the money, call the people, show this is the check dam, I'm going to build it. They build it, give it to the people, and go to the next project. But who's there to teach them about maintenance, about forming together and using the water? No one. And that is not the role of the government. So here is where NGOs play the role. So I hope you understand that. The NGOs is like a bridge between the public and the government agency. They are well-trained people. Most of them are well-trained people, educated people. I work for an NGO, for example, before I came to IIT Bombay. Um, and it is one of the leading NGOs in India. So um, it was very uh, active uh, working with the people on the ground to show what is water conservation, how to use groundwater better, etc. So I'll show you some images 
uh, on these and how you can think about water management from the perspective of NGOs, which are the pillars in achieving the rural water management with the government and with the public, because they don't, um, they need not talk much between them. However, the NGOs know how to talk to the government agency and the NGOs know how to talk to the local people. They sensitize them to understand the role of these water management schemes and infrastructure. So the sensitization part or teaching part, clarification part is done by these NGOs. For example, there's an NGO for um, studies, um, education of girls, etc. What they do is they go to these remote villages, tribal villages and set up a camp and then they do these um, teaching of uh, classes and educational activities, physical activities, etc. There are other NGOs who have health camps for uh, rural regions because sometimes uh, the, the, the rural people may not go to the hospital, they're afraid, but these NGOs go there and then say, okay, you have to have these vaccinations, you have to have these medicines. So it is a, it is a very important role that NGOs play. Uh, so they sensitize them, they first talk to them, they clarify all the doubts and then they get them on board for water conservation. So it is their role to understand, uh, the, to make them understand these water management schemes and infrastructures, train the locals to maintain these price structures. There's no price for this um, uh, check dams. However, it is, it is very, very valuable. The, the farmers do not pay a price. They're not going to play, okay, I'm going to uh, uh, give you money to build a check dam. They're not paying. All they're doing is using the benefits. Are they uh, paying every month a, a rent for the check dam? Not. They are using the benefits and thinking it is free. So it is not free. That is what the uh, local NGOs train them. Also, they identify volunteers in the location who they could train and let them manage the water better. Why does this happen? Because the NGO also has to go to the next asset, next village, next district. For example, the Arn Foundation, as I said, um, they work in one area in Madurai. But if they said, okay, I'll only work in Madurai, then only the benefits are with Madurai in um, South India. Then they work uh, again to another location and then Coimbatore, et cetera, et cetera. Vasan is a good NGO who, which works with the Odisha government for millets. Uh, they are very, very uh, well known for uh, providing, you know, um, training materials to grow millets, etc. But then if they say, okay, I only work in Karnataka or where they are from, then the benefits are not reached. And that is not sustainable also. For one check time, you cannot have one NGO sitting there. So it is better to identify the volunteers, train them, and then just closely watch them or you have phone call often every month or so. And then let them develop the system and then you go to the next system. That is the beauty of an NGO's work. Better acceptance if trained by locals. So the NGOs would train the volunteers. For example, there's a village of 100 people and then there are 10% of youth. 10 are college going kids. Uh, the NGO would talk to the 10 person and say, I will train you on these water. You go train the rest 90% of the population and then they will do. Now, the 90% of the population would readily agree with the, their own local youth rather than an NGO or a government agency telling them. So it is the goal of the NGO to find these volunteers, make them understand the concept of water conservation, and then they will take care of them. Better monitoring. If the locals are there, the monitoring is better. The NGOs are there, they will think creatively on how to monitor. So for example, when I was in the NGO, we use satellites to monitor these uh, activities of how the check dams are built, how the water is being stored, etc. That is very, very valuable data. Long-term capacity is built. Uh, as I said, the Vasan uh, Dan Foundation, if you go there, uh, readily people know it, the villagers know it. They don't know the government agency which built the check dam, but they know the NGO who helped them to understand the check dam. So that is the beauty. It's not like taking credit, but they make them understand. So long-term capacity is built between the NGO and the NGO directly tells, this is built by the government, we are there to help you. And then the bridge is formed. So this long-term bridge is formed and they also monitor them uh, quite oftenly on how things are done. So what are the ways forward? Moving on, the best way 
uh, for uh, ownership is to have public participatory with NGOs, where NGOs are able to train the public. So understand that ownership was not taken because they didn't understand the system also. They know how to uh, manage uh, a check dam, for example. They don't know how to build, rebuild a check dam when it's broken. So what do they do? They don't, don't take care of it. So that is where this public participatory with NGOs help a lot because they train, but they won't do it. They let the people do the work. They're only there for training. One example is this, uh, where NGOs call the volunteers. So these are the local volunteers uh, from the uh, village. Uh, and then the NGO person you could see uh, is telling them how to use the water level meter, how to look at the well and know the depth of the water well so that you know how much groundwater you're using. If you know how much groundwater uh, is level, level is there, then you know how much you can pump. Otherwise, you'll just take out all the water, you'll lose energy, the diesel pump, and or you'll waste the water. And you could see all the youth are participating from uh, younger people, uh, school kids, everyone will be there because they normally do these activities on a weekend. Let's take some case studies. Uh, one is the tank restorations by Dan Foundation in, in South of India. You could see here that first they would go and talk to the public and say, uh, this area was initially a traditionally a tank, uh, a village tank which was catering for water. Now, since the king's rules all went off, that tank has been just there, no one has taken care of it. Uh, and the government, as I said, has a mandate only for some part of the tank, not all the tank. So it is up to the people. And the Sardan Foundation went into the ground, identified the volunteers, got some money from uh, donations and also government to help build the structure of the dam, the, on the sides of the tank, sorry, tank, on, the, on the, um, the banks, the banks and all. But they need labor, so they brought the people saying that we will only work on the tank if all the, for every person of every house have to come and help, okay? You could see all the locals uh, helping. And then now the water is rejuvenated. People are happy. Um, uh, they can readily use the water for their own village. It's not like they're building it for someone else. It is for them, but they need that push. And that gentle push is given by the NGO. So um, another case study I'm going to show is from NM Sadhguru Foundation, which is also a very known, uh, well-known NGO in Dahod, Gujarat, uh, where I do have some um, field experience. Uh, you could see that uh, water was just wasted. It was just going uh, along the big, big elevations, just going down without getting stored. Uh, in those regions, water is already less. And if it is not um, sustainably uh, checked, but sustainably stored, it just goes down and then goes um, as a loss to the system. So what they did is they brought the community together. They got some funds um, from their resources um, and then uh, they said donations, volunteers, but most importantly, the government schemes, etc. They talked to the government and then they built these um, massive, massive structures. Look at it. They built this in 85 days along with the people. And this indicating their interest, involvement, and ownership. So what has happened is because they help, the, all of these uh, locals helped to hand build this uh, check dam, they equal, uh, equally have rights to use it. Everyone is enjoying the benefit. And if something happens, all these uh, people who took part will come back again, and they know how they built it, so they know how to repair it. Okay. So this is how beautifully NGOs can work on building a public participatory approach. Okay, so public participation is called public participatory approach um, um, and also ownership. Once the public participates, then the NGO will uh, set back and say, okay, bye, you take care of your check dam, I'll go to the next check dam. Because there's a lot of areas for uh, work needed. And when that happens, these people would uh, readily work on it and manage it, this village people, for example. Suppose they cannot solve the issue. Suppose there's a major engineering problem. Still, they have the NGOs for number. They know the NGO people. They will just readily go to the office and then say, hey, we have this issue. Can you come and help us? And they will readily help us. Or the NGOs can connect with the engineers from the water resource department, state or central government, and then help to retribute. Initially, the villagers didn't know who to ask. If something happens and breaks, 
they don't know who to ask to, to solve these issues. But now they know the NGO and the NGO has all the connections. They go, by, they go by rules and regulation. They cannot just build anywhere. They have to get clearances from the government. They have to uh, notify all these water resource departments and then they do this. So they have the connections and they know how to uh, make the bridges uh, between the people and the government. So all this was built, as I said, through involvement and ownership. It's not only building structures, maintenance is an issue, uh, water uh, long-term sustainability is an issue. So how do you uh, address it? By building involvement, ownership, and long-term goals. This is what this project has done. Now, what also they told us, now you've, okay, I, we've built the check dam, we built a long uh, check dam water is being stored. How can you use it? And as I said, it is a holistic approach. It's not just storing the water. So what they also did is typical soil and, and uh, soil uh, and moisture conservation works um, have you being used along with the water conservation. Okay, so soil, for example, they said, okay, you should be tilling these uh, levels and on the sides you have to have buns to prevent the water from going and also prevent the soil from eroding to the ground elevations. Uh, so they made these buns, made sure the water stays inside the field, made sure the soil um, doesn't get eroded by wind or by water flow. And they have specified watershed development programs within the community. All this was built along with the community. So some of the NGO people would be highly educated, PhDs or, or engineers, um, masters, etc. So they know how to do these and along with the traditional knowledge of the public, both of these would share knowledge and then make these uh, constructions. And those uh, would stand along for a long time. And NGOs not only work on one aspect, they try to cover the holistic aspect. For example, here, they said, okay, we block the water. We also do soil and water conservation so that we can have the whole benefit. And it is for the community and program implemented by the community can do better if supported by local and government funds. So local is your panjayat funds, your local body funds, and the government would be two types, your central and state government. There are central government money for the Mantrega money, which can be used for uh, NRM activities. And there is the state water department uh, funds, which can be used. So there are funds um, uh, which can be used to make these kind of activities. They cannot pay for salaries for the locals because it is their own property, their own village they're working for. So most of the time they won't pay for salaries, but they can pay for the instruments. For example, they need a big JCP to come and dig these buns. Uh, they need a cement work. Uh, so those raw materials they can purchase. That is where I'm trying to uh, end this session as convergence of funds is necessary. Each rural entity can access um, available funds and missions, which means there is uh, Jal Jeevan mission, for example, for rural uh, drinking water supply. It mandates to have a tank, a water tank on the top, uh, but uh, the water has to go there and there should be water. So the pump they'll give, but where is the water? If the water doesn't come, uh, there is some uh, issues with the mission. So uh, you can use that part of the money to actually uh, take care of these storage structures so that water can be stored and from the storage, it can go to the tank and tank the tap, okay? Where people can all use it for drinking and domestic use. So this is a, a quick example I've given. The possibility of these funds depend on the location and the government scheme, which is already there. The benefits from each fund can be evaluated against common goals. So here the common goal is storing the water and using it. So it can be domestic use, it can be agricultural use, etc. So for the storing, if there's no funds, we can tie it up with the domestic use, which is Jaljeevan Mission or the Agricultural Department, Ministry of Agriculture and Irrigation, to make these water resources uh, more uh, apt for the rural village. And a common goal is saving the water and using it for development. Plan on continuation of the benefits through convergence of funds. So this is the maintenance evaluation part. So maybe Jaljeevan has money to take care of the tanks. So that money can also, the person who's taking care of the tank can also take care of the check dam, which is 
storing the water, putting the water to the tank. It is one um, uh, common uh, you know, linkage. Without the tank, uh, there's no water for the public. Without the check dam, there's no water for the tank, something like that analogy I'm saying. Need to understand the government keeps in debt. This is where I'm saying all these examples can be given, but uh, is it possible or not? Is there a line drawn by the government saying no check dam should supply water for the tank? Uh, all these has to be looked at. And that is the role of the government officer and the NGO. So if you're in a village and you want to help identify good NGOs nearby, identify the government agencies, they will also recommend some NGOs who have worked in those areas. Uh, and most of them are uh, actually registered. So, um, and actually do a lot of work. You can just quickly look at uh, what work they've done. Have they published reports, books, uh, papers, etc. So there's a lot of examples we can give and I'll be happy to go through these examples in the next class. Until then, thank you. I will conclude here.